Hi, and thanks for joining me. I've been reading Robert Jobson's book, all day, from the early hours of the morning to this point, and I've come to the conclusion that it's rather beige, wrinkled, and too long, a little bit like Meghan Markle's Hamptons outfit. Now, I have made a few notes, as you would expect, and I've got a few juicy revelations, but nothing too exciting. However, this video won't be a complete waste of time. You will notice that I have paid tribute to the beige with my outfit, so I fit in with a general vibe. Now, my my first observation would have to be that I feel like I've read all this information before in other books on Catherine the Princess of Wales by rather uninspiring authors, so I won't name them. Um, and also I feel like I've read a lot of it from Robert Jobson's own book, William at 40. And at times I felt like he forgot who he was writing about. It seemed like sometimes he was firmly in the I'm writing a biography of Catherine the Princess of Wales territory. And at other times he sort of just sort of swung off. And I thought, okay, now we're getting into William at 40 territory. Is he ever going to actually swing the ship back around and get back to the subject at hand? Also, there were a few chapters on the dastardly duo, Harry and Meghan, and they didn't really reveal anything new at all. In fact, it seemed to be lifted entirely from Harry's book Spare. And quite often, Robert Jobson himself would actually say, as Harry said in Spare, so he made it very clear where he got his information from. What next? A few bits caught my eye. Now, one of these was the fact that when Harry and Meghan's first romance was announced, that Harry made that statement to register his disgust at the wave of abuse and harassment directed at Meghan. And Robert Jobson actually makes the point that a lot of us YouTubers have made over the last few years that at that time, at that time of that statement, that there wasn't a wave of abuse and harassment at Meghan. The tabloid media at that point were very supportive, very complimentary. It was almost like they were just printing Meghan's press pack. Where it wasn't complimentary and where the abuse and harassment originated was online, on X. Now, we all know that Harry has a penchant for actually scrolling on X or Twitter back when he was, you know, doom scrolling, probably when he first started doom scrolling. And he would do that late at night. And it was actually reported in Battle of Brothers and also Palace Papers that at his time of dating Cressida, that he very much was a doom scroller, that his office used to be on standby. I think Valentine Lowe even mentioned it in his book because it depended what he'd read on Twitter the night before, just how poopy he was going to be and how much response he would demand against the dreaded media. But the thing is, it wasn't occurring in the media. It was firmly on social media. And Harry has always had trouble distinguishing between the two. Now, Robert Jobson does refer to the dog bowl incident, but he refers to it in not great detail. He doesn't give us all the juice like Harry did in Spare about the dog bowl supposedly breaking and his necklace being ripped from his neck and William's rage and his snide remark at Harry as he marches out the door. We didn't get all that, you know, really vivid detail. All all Robert Jobson says is that Harry claims that William physically attacked him and then he observes that their relationship will never recover due to, and I quote, incidents Harry regards as a series of public betrayals. He doesn't give us any detail. He doesn't tell us what those public betrayals are. But we can see that Harry had no idea that the person that was doing the most damage, that was doing all the leaking and briefing, that was backgrounding against him, was actually, beware Harry, it's coming from inside the house. Although she was over at her baby shower in New York at the time this purported incident took place. Now, Harry... I don't know if he even has any idea now that the palace was in full on control mode at that time. The press had already got a whiff of it. And the reason why William went round to Notcott to try and warn him to try to get him to take action, to try to get him to talk to Meghan, was the fact that they knew that the press had a hold of it. And for two years, the palace kept that under wraps for Harry and Meghan. 
Valentine Lowe had observed their behaviour, their appalling behaviour towards their staff on their tour of Australia. So this was very soon after that William was actually visiting Harry in Not Cot. But don't forget, it wasn't revealed. Valentine Lowe did not reveal it in the Times in full until just before the Oprah Winfrey interview. Now, Robert Jobson also mentions whispers of pettiness and jealousy. And of course, I beg to differ there. But an interesting observation is the fact that we have heard Robert Jobson make these claims before, but he's mainly directed them at William. In this book, he does mention uh, whispers of pettiness and jealousy coming from Catherine and William which is sort of a new revelation. Then later on, he contradicts himself and says that Catherine never encouraged any unfavorable comparisons in the press between her and Meghan. So he sort of backtracks. I don't think he's even keeping track of his own narrative at this stage. Now, the reason why I beg to differ is that I don't think it was pettiness and jealousy. It was a growing awareness and it was also distrust. Jobson also claims that courtiers were treating her with a certain haughtiness and also treating Harry with a certain haughtiness. And that was because the Queen had directed not to put up with their BS, if I can be so crude. She didn't like the way Harry was behaving and she had told her close members of staff that it wasn't on and that they could pull him into line if it was required. Also, I think everyone saw them coming from a mile off. And I think that they knew that there was already leakings and briefings against Catherine to make her look haughty, to make her look unfriendly. They knew that Laney Gossip, for example, in Canada had done that rather defamatory article about Catherine being unfriendly and not giving a lift to Megan in the shop. So from the very early days, there was sort of backgrounding going on against Catherine, the Princess of Wales, and so they encircled her in a circle of protection. They were cautious and careful. And I think that is very different from pettiness and jealousy. I mean, when we come down to it, Catherine knows that one day she is going to be queen. William knows that one day he is going to be king. Why would he be threatened by someone sort of six on the call sheet for suits and six on the call sheet as far as the monarchy goes. I mean, come on, it's just so far-fetched. They were so far down the pecking order, why would they be a threat? Now, to give Robert Jobson his due, he does mention that Catherine did not invite or encourage any polarizing portrayals by the press. And he goes on to say that it was the press's own invention. This constant comparison between Catherine and Meghan. He said that was not a result of briefing from Kensington Palace. There was nothing going on in that regard. It was an invention to sell newspapers, to sell juice, to get everyone whipped up. And we all know the damage that inevitably caused. So we get told the lip gloss story again. And I think you're probably like me that you wish you could never hear that lip gloss story again. We are so sick of it. And also <laughs> we're sick of hearing about the fact that Catherine grimaced when Megan put the lip gloss on her finger and then applied it to her lips. It's obviously meant to imply that Catherine at the very least is standoffish and haughty and at the very worst some, has some sort of racial problem with Megan, which of course is just so ridiculous. Now, I would assume that maybe the lip gloss tip touched Megan's finger or, you know, really, if my lip gloss touched anyone's finger or touched anyone's lips, I'd be throwing it out and getting a new tube. Because really, it's just a matter of basic hygiene. You don't share lipstick, you don't share lip gloss. Okay, guys, you can stop writing about this now. You obviously have no basic understanding of that. Harry seemed also rather petulant and short-tempered and had been very rude to members of staff leading up to his wedding. He was not a happy little bridegroom, but we already knew that. We already knew that. We already know most of this. Now, Jobson also shares that in July, the year of Archie's birth, that negative press outweighed good press. Now, I found that really helpful, actually. I found that quite a juicy revelation because we all know that Harry and Meghan claimed that they received the bad press, that it turned distinctly when they got back from their Australian tour. 
Well, this is way after the Australian tour. So thank you very much, Robert Jobson, for correcting that timeline. He firmly observes that that is when the negative press started. So that completely debunks everything that was claimed in the Harry and Meghan Netflix docuseries that had heralded their return from Australia. He also puts down the perception that uh, Harry and Meghan wanted to have their cake and eat it too. And this was sort of running rife through the whole press gallery. They, you know, their private jets, the secrecy surrounding Archie's birth, the secret godparents, the rejection of the royal family to join them for holiday and instead the embrace of holidaying with Elton and, uh, you know, all that. Uh, it was getting recognised by the press. Also, there was a lot of doubling down on this, you know, sort of uh, virtue signalling about climate change and, you know, watching your emissions and all that sort of thing. Meanwhile, they're using private jets to go just about everywhere constantly and frequently. So the press was getting rather jaded. Again, a case of having your cake and wanting to eat it too, as Jobson observes with that very uninteresting cliche. We do hear that Charles tried to treat Meghan with the same love and affection as he did Catherine. And then Robert Jobson observes that they were very different characters. Can we say that once more for the people up the back, Robert? <laughs> Yes, they are very different characters. You know what? I'm astounded by the insight in this book. I mean, it's just gobsmacking, isn't it? All these revelations about Megan's character and the fact that she's very different to Catherine, the Princess of Wales. I'm so glad I read it. <laughs> I never would have known. Also, though, which I found quite heartwarming and moving and sad, was the fact that Harry and Meghan's behaviour since has cut King Charles III to the quick. And that is a direct quote. Their behaviour has cut him to the quick. For Queen Elizabeth II, he claims it was never personal. It was all about safeguarding the institution she served. And he observes that it's been very easy for Harry to blame everybody except the Queen. He blamed his father. He blamed William. But he never really sort of faced the fact that it was the Queen he let down, it was the Queen that was appalled, it was the Queen that took steps, and it was the Queen that made the decisions to protect the institution of the monarchy, as is her duty. So it was her decisions all along. It was her decisions, Harry. But the fact is that your father and brother backed her up, unlike you. A quote that I've never heard before attributed to Queen Elizabeth II was the fact that she saw Harry as a maverick who had let her down. Now Harry was shocked and hurt at the reaction and he felt that he'd been banished after the Sandringham Summit. He really did. He felt like his whole family turned their back on him and his anger with his father and brother was palpable. And I'm sure that Robert Jobson was actually in a great position to observe that anger and to receive the uh, appropriate briefings <laughs> to illustrate that anger. Uh, Jobson also states clearly that the claims of racism against the royal family do not stack up against their body of work in public life. And he says that really clearly. He also states that from William's point of view, Harry's behaviour is unforgivable and that he can no longer be trusted. Now, we'll all remember those scenes of Catherine turning up for that Royal Command performance uh, just after it broke from Omid Scobie's book that, you know, Catherine was one of the alleged racists for the leak of the Dutch edition and also King Charles III. And Robert Jobson says that Catherine was really saddened that she was linked with Meghan's claims. And like William, she has zero tolerance for racism and believes it has no place in society. Now, he goes on to describe, you know, wonderful things about Catherine's work during the pandemic, all her successful early childhood projects. And I actually outlined all of those in detail in another video playing tribute to Catherine's work. And I'll link that in the description box below. I think I actually go into just as much detail as Robert Jobson. So you might as well just watch my video. <laughs> That was a plug, wasn't it? If I've got to sit through and read all of Robert Jobson's book for you, you've got to go and watch my Catherine video, okay? That's payment. 
<laughs> so Queen Elizabeth was very proud of Catherine's Hold Still photo exhibition. She really was, and the subsequent book that was published. And she actually said that photographs have captured the resilience of the British people at such a challenging time. And she, you know, she thought that Catherine had done a really good job and she really admired the fact that Catherine went around about all her work with minimum fuss and really no drama. And she wasn't about drawing attention to herself. She was about drawing attention to the project. He notes too that on the day of Prince Philip's funeral, Catherine showed real warmth and compassion to the then Prince Charles. She was often seen sort of chatting warmly to him, offering support, um, giving him a lot of sympathy through her eyes because, of course, they all had masks on there. Megan, meanwhile, was making sure her wreath got enough attention and publicity. I'll never forgive her that during Prince Philip's funeral, um, you know, it broke about the wreath about Megan's wreath and all the details about the flowers and what even what she wrote on the note. It was really, really sickening and grasping for attention at just the wrong time. He also mentions the Wales's move to Adelaide Cottage and that he says that it was accelerated because William knew that any remaining time with his grandmother, Queen Elizabeth, was really precious. And he was really delighted that Catherine was 100% behind that move, 100% behind him wanting to spend more time with the Queen. Now, I'm going to finish with a rather compelling admission, and I'm going to read this to you verbatim as a direct quote, because I think it's quite impactful, because it's the first time I've actually seen it in print about this subject in this way. Sadly, Catherine and William have been subjected to many vicious and unjust attacks and false accusations, particularly from the so-called Sussex Squad, who are supporters of Meghan Markle. He then goes on to lay the blame for the false rumours about Rose Hancock and William firmly at the Sussex Squad's feet. Now, that is really gratifying. He lays at their feet that the spreading of these sort of scurrilous rumours against William and Rose Hancock that have been proved to be, you know, patently untrue and not founded on anything, they are not factual, they are defamatory and they are incorrect, he found that they were spread online by the Sussex squad. So to wrap it up, I would not recommend this book I really wouldn't. And most books that I review on this channel, I do recommend, with the exception being I'm at Scobie's Endgame. If you're interested in it, and there are, you know, good bits, but I wouldn't recommend that you rush out to buy the book. I just, it felt tired. It felt boring. It felt like someone writing a class assignment that they were, you know, was due at midnight that night and they were just going through the motions to get it done. It really felt that uninteresting and bland. I wrote here, I found it long and lacking heart and somebody bored to the back teeth getting it done because he had no real warmth or connection with his subject. And then I said again, which I think I mentioned at the beginning, quite frankly, half the time I think he forgot who he was writing about. I was not titillated. I was not entertained. I was not particularly informed. It was a grind. So I would wait until it turns up in a discount sort of bargain bin. Uh, and grab it if you're interested then, or order it from the library. Having said that, I will say, to be fair, that I found his book, William at 40, to be much better. I actually found that to be really moving. I found he sort of connected with that subject. He was quite warm. And I thought the ending of that book was compelling and really almost made me tear up. I, I loved it. So he can write but I think this was just a cynical exercise. It was a matter of churning something out in favour of Catherine the Princess of Wales. I think it's rather telling that he opens the book with her making her video, you know, telling us about her cancer diagnosis. That felt cynical and, yeah, just nothing came across very well. So to finish up, Robert Jobson's book on Catherine the Princess of Wales it's a big fat no from me. And I'll see you again 
very soon. Bye. Bye.